the gravitational field of the Earth at that point is outward, not inward. Hmm. Yeah, you, we can go through the math if you wish. <laughs> I would love to because I've heard you say that the hollow Earth theory or this one isn't a belief, it's a calculation. And uh, I guess, how does the math support the idea of a void inside the Earth? Okay, with the the mass is what causes our what we call gravity. That mm -hmm. That's our accepted physical theory, that mass is the source of gravity, if you will. Gravity as we know it. Right. But at the center of the Earth, all the mass is away from the center, not towards the center. So at that point, it should be zero or possibly even, given gravitational wave theory, it can vary above and below zero mm -hmm. by some small amount. When I say below zero, that means it is now a repulsive force, ever so slight. Right on. So, I mean, the conventional theory is that it is densest at the core. Am I right? Yes, that's a conventional academic scholarly approach to it because, well, nobody's been there to know for sure. Mm -hmm. But the math <laughs> says it should be very near or at zero. Huh. Well, can you elaborate a bit more on where the math shows us that because i think mathematical proof of a void is a bit new to most of us we're taught the earth is densest in the center that gravity is focused around that central point in the core where it is the densest how do we know it isn't how do we know it is well that's <laughs> that, true that's the other end of that stick how do we know it is because the mass of the earth is a set amount kind of even though it increases a little bit all the time. And it is on the outside of the center. The exact center of the Earth would be a sum of gravity of zero. Now you get away from that center some distance, and you will find that there is now gravitational pull towards the outside of the Earth, towards the surface. When I'm, but I'm talking minute distances here, right? not atomic distances, but actually very small, even molecular distances might be right, up to a few miles, perhaps. We don't know what the materials are in that region of the Earth. We don't know what the materials are at, say, half the radius of the Earth, hmm. because we've never mined it. We've never drilled that far. We speculate that it is as science says. But they're speculating based on some facts, certainly some data, all of it theoretical, incidentally, huh. because there's no way to get there, according to science. Right. So when we, we look at experiments that have been done, what insight can we get? Because you've said that uh, 14 kilometers was the deepest hole ever bored, you know, officially, of course, but those results didn't really match the mainstream theory you know, what kind of insights did we get from that particular experiment or others like it? The Kola borehole is, I believe, what you're referring to. And it was done by the Russians back in the early to mid-70s. And yes, it went 14 kilometers, 14,000 meters, about uh, nine and a half miles. And it encountered temperatures, pressures, and materials well outside of what was expected. And in fact, that shut down the goal of going to 20 kilometers because the material was way too hard, way too dense, way too hot, and it was boiling gaseous nitrogen out of a hole where there shouldn't be gaseous nitrogen. Hmm. So everything went wrong with that experiment as far as confirming the speculation that we call theory because all theory is speculation and yet they didn't change the science they just said we don't know what to think of this and we still believe it's this way instead of what the experiment showed us <laughs> yeah it's funny how they do that it is funny how they do that but the most important thing of that whole scenario in my opinion it's actually two of them but the density of the material way closer to the surface than they expected and the temperature way closer to the surface than they expected. And thirdly, the gas, hydrogen gas, 
what could form hydrogen gas 10 miles down. Mm -hmm. Shouldn't that, you know, that lightest element we have have already migrated out of the earth and not be in the <laughs> rock? Right, right. But this leads me to another speculative that I did not invent or anything. Credit goes to two people, actually. Uh, Dr. Maxlow from Australia, New Zealand, and Neil Adams, a comic book artist from New York, who made an animation showing a growing Earth. Mm -hmm. And according to the way both those guys get down to it, 75 to 100 million years ago, our oceans were tiny, but the land masses were the same size then that they are now. Mm -hmm. They arrived at this, Maxwell arrived at it, by looking at the borehole data from ocean bottom, basalt and different materials that have been brought up, and they gauge the age of these materials. Well, according to this, there is no subduction, just that the ocean basins are growing and the radius of the Earth is increasing. And in 75 to 100 million years, it has nearly doubled in diameter. Hmm. Yeah, you sent me that video, and I watched the time lapse of how the Earth has grown from his perspective. And it is fascinating the way the land masses fit together and everything. But this maybe gets into, you know, how it connects to the hollow Earth. Because in the paradigm that I've heard you talk about, instead of there being land masses like Agartha inside that the Nazis escaped to, there's something much weirder. I guess you talk about a, uh, a black white hole pair. Can you describe that for us? Sure. Uh, probably most of your listeners are aware of what is believed about black holes, that anything that falls into this high gravity field, including light, can never escape. Mm -hmm. Matter, light, energy, whatever enters the black hole's gravitational well will never be seen again, except that Einstein, Rosen, Bridge, and every other thing that led up to the whole black hole thing as an astronomical body requires that Einstein, Rosen, Bridge to have a white hole at the other end. So energy comes, energy and matter can be emitted from a white hole, but nothing can enter it. It is the exact and Antipathy of a black hole. Hmm. But it doesn't necessarily mean that it's, you know, as big enough to swallow a galaxy or even a planet. It could be just making a few pairs of matter antimatter. But because of the way the Einstein Rosen bridge works, time is weird and antimatter will travel back in time to the black hole because it's antimatter. Hmm. That's another speculation. But the reality is we know that Einstein's E equals MC squared theory says that energy is a equivalent and equivalent to the mass times the speed of light squared. Well, you can turn that around and solve it for the mass or the speed of light if you know the energy. Mm -hmm. So when an energy pair erupts from a white hole, or in some cases within a collider, you have a matter-antimatter pair that form. Sometimes they come back together and annihilate. In fact, almost all the time, they come back together and annihilate each other, creating a burst of energy. Sometimes, though, the antimatter will be drawn off. And here we're talking about collider physics and the the matter the newly formed matter is free in our world and it's still pretty energetic because it's still moving really fast but it is new matter so if the earth and any other rocky body or any other body with a gravitational field experiences the same thing then new matter is being put there it's not actually being created so much as it's being sucked in somewhere else, sent through a, I don't know, what do you want to call it? An einstein Rosen bridge, subspace, anything you want to call it. And it finds its way to each and every one of those gravitational bodies in minute amounts. 
but over 75 or 100 million years, apparently it's enough to double the diameter of the Earth. But only at that center zero point of that gravitational field. Hmm. <laughs> wow, man. I mean, this is quite different than anything I've heard described before. I don't even know if I've heard anyone talk about the idea of a white hole before. But I guess when we're talking about the growing Earth theory, it can't grow without more matter creation of some type. And this is essentially what's doing that, right? It's kind of like a, a matter factory and it's having a net positive out of this exchange, which is creating more matter, which is causing the Earth to grow. That's my theory, yes. Hmm. And the math, I mean, you can, yes, you can manipulate math to simulate or even in, intimate a lot of things that may or may not be true, which, you know, cosmologists do every day. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and this one works, you know, yes, there will be arguments against it if I ever actually publish it, but it works. So to say that there is a void at the center of the earth, yes. I'm saying, yes, there is a void. I don't know how big it is. It might be the size of a grapefruit, or it might be the size of a beach ball, or it might be, you know, 300 miles across or 3,000 miles across, although I doubt that one. Mm -hmm. I think it's actually quite small. As far as anybody being able to live there, not any life that we know, because it's extremely energetic atmosphere or environment. Mm -hmm. more energetic than if it were that molten core, incidentally. Right. And that is interesting because there are some people kind of on the weirder end of, of the hollow earth spectrum, you know, the new agey kind of stuff that I don't really get into, but they talk about it as more of a realm, of an energetic realm. And uh, that's odd, but from this perspective, it seems to jive with if there ever was any type of life or anything there, it would have to be something more energetic than you know traditional flesh and blood life yeah and it would would not be oxygen and carbon based mm -hmm. because it would be carbon dioxide instantly with the addition of that much energy huh so i mentioned liking the thought of inner earth land masses and that whole model and it's a little simpler to understand why the gatekeepers would want to hide that from us but why cover this paradigm up what are the implications of this model that they wouldn't want us to know about well, that's a great question. First of all, let's look at who keeps the gate or who we suspect keeps the gate. Sure. Politicians in the employ of corporations and whatnot. Elites. Right. Elites who have invested heavily in petroleum, hydroelectric, solar. You know, they've, they've invested literally hundreds of trillions of dollars over the last 15 years into alternative energy but they've kept pumping more and more petroleum all the time. Mm -hmm. And they're making money off each and every one of them. But if this is galactic level energies and we can capture it and somehow control it, which is actually <laughs> dangerous all by itself, <laughs> yeah. then they're out of business. That's true. So anytime you talk about gravitational energies, not just academia, but everybody shuts down. <laughs> you know, it's considered the weak force in physics, and yet it's pervasive throughout the entire universe. Now, another bit of info from your presentation that you sent me that kind of supports this is you say that the Earth continuously produces and emits roughly four terawatts more thermal energy than it receives from the sun. Can you uh, put that in layman's terms for us? Why is that important? What does that indicate? Well, let's start with the explanation that the scientists will give you. Well, that is the leftover heat from friction when the Earth formed four billion years ago, emitting four terawatts still. <laughs> um, mm. That part does not add up to me. Right. To put it in layman's terms, how much energy that is, today it is roughly equivalent to one-third of the amount of electricity used in the Earth, or on the surface of the Earth, by mankind all the time. Hmm. So, 
Yeah, that would put a few of them out of business. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's true. So when you've talked about this in the past, you've kind of alluded to the fact that the planets in the solar system and maybe even the galaxy would be somehow connected through, you know, maybe these black hole, white hole pairs that are at the center of, of course, all of them would be the same, I guess. If planets form one way, this would be how they form in this paradigm. Is there something some, something connecting them in some way? Uh, yes. And it is an Einstein-Rosen bridge, uh, a wormhole, if you will. But when we think of a wormhole and when popular entertainment and even most scientist types think of a wormhole, they think of one end is a black hole, one end is a white hole. But my contention is that one end is the black hole at the center of the galaxy, and it's connected to every other massive body in the galaxy, and maybe some beyond. Hmm. So, yes, there is one force in the entire galaxy that more or less governs the life and evolution of the galaxy. Hmm. That's interesting, and I, I'm wonder what the implications of such a thing would be because it, it seems like you know it's kind of hard for my simple stoner mind to comprehend what you could extrapolate from that but it seems pretty important well i think it's important and it has many opportunities as well as many dangers because first of all we don't know how to deal with it we can't even get a good handle on what gravity is or how it truly behaves how it interacts with matter or light and we know that it does or any other form of energy. But if we ever figure that out, then we may be able to tap in not only to the energy part of it, but also to the instantaneous aspect of it disappears here and it appears here. Many, 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 many hundreds, maybe thousands of light years, maybe millions of light years away hmm. instantly. Yeah. <laughs> well, you know, I've talked to plenty of researchers who have alluded that they think UFOs come from inside the Earth. And now we're not talking about civilizations inside, but is it possible that these things could be used for travel amongst the planets? It seems like they could. Well, I can't rule it out, but I also can't show you technology that would help you achieve that. Yeah. The engineering aspects of it are, again, we don't even know what gravity is, to be honest. Yeah. And the, the recent NASA EU gravity wave experiments do not impress me because they're using light to measure gravity. <laughs> <laughs> now, what, what are your thoughts on the uh, electric universe paradigm that gravity is actually a byproduct of some kind of electrical force? It, it has some merits. I'm not completely sold yet, but it does have some merits, particularly when you couple it to the other phenomena that they cite, auroras and whatnot, because there's certainly an electrical aspect to that. Now, whether the electrical aspect is the side effect or vice versa, it's too soon for me to tell. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I find that fascinating. There's also a lot of older scientists who used to talk about the ether, the idea that space isn't just an empty void, that it's an actual fabric that is a conductor of certain electrical waves. Just like the ocean houses water waves, space would house some type of uh, electrical waves that are also somewhat invisible and hard to pin down, but that that would be the medium of creation for all this kind of stuff. And it gets into, you know, old legends of alchemy and that kind of thing. I think that's mm -hmm. interesting. Do you find there to be any merit in the idea of an ether or something other than a void? Sure. We hear about Albert Einstein's theory of relativity, but we almost never hear about Lawrence's Lorentzian relativity. Hmm. And Lawrence built his theory around an ether, ether, however you want to pronounce it. Yeah. And either one of them works the same when you do the math on our GPS satellites, because they're programmed in for a time relativity difference of their travel around the earth to the earth and it works in either system but if you go a little further than that higher speeds if you will more closely approaching 
the speed of light, then Lawrence's theory is a better predictor. Hmm. There was a guy by the name of Tom Van Flandern. He was um, an astronomer at the Naval Observatory in Washington, D.C. for a career's length. Mm -hmm. And he took that particular question to task quite effectively. And no one ever gave a good argument of why he was wrong. I think you can still find it online. I'm not certain. Uh, metaphysics.org. And uh, he, he had some other interesting theories or hypotheses that fold into the whole new matter, hollow earth, gravity well thing, hmm. including one that he called the exploding planets hypothesis, that there was once a planet beyond Mars, but the side of Jupiter, and that Mars was one of its satellites, that this giant planet, not as giant as Jupiter, but giant compared to Mars and Earth, exploded. And that's why one side of Mars and one side of the moon is peppered with impacts, and the other side is not. In fact, one of the impacts on Mars nearly went completely through the planet. <laughs> wow, man. Yeah, that is interesting. And I, I wanted to kind of talk about the history of the hollow earth theory and scientists who have come to the conclusion that there might be some type of void. In the slides from your presentation, you talk about a guy named uh, Edmund Halley who put forth his hollow earth paradigm in 1692. Can you tell us about his model at all? Sure. His model had uh, seven concentric spheres and they revolved at slightly different speeds. And he thought that it was possible for cultures and civilizations to exist in there and still have light and heat and food and all the things that a civilization would need. He arrived at his theory, his model, by conducting a magnetic study, uh, a compass study, if you will, of the North Atlantic Ocean up into southern arctic ocean around all the way around greenland and he found that it of course it changed wherever you went that the magnetic pole did not match up with the axis pole the geographic pole and went home and while he wasn't distracted funding a guy by the name of isaac newton on his theories mm -hmm. <laughs> he came up with his hollow earth, or uh, he didn't really call it a hollow earth model. He called it a model of the earth. Yeah. <laughs> That's an interesting paradigm for sure. And he's also the guy who predicted that this one comet would come back every 76 years and it is still named Halley's Comet. Ah, <laughs> very cool. So, you then say that he was the last serious scientist to attempt to describe the hollow earth until Leonard Euler, who was an 18th century ma uh, mathematician. How did his model differ? Well, his model may not have even have been serious at first, <laughs> at least, but it showed a, a hollow shaft going all the way through the earth at the poles. Mm-hmm a void of some size, hard to tell from his drawing, within there at the center point. And he based his on mostly gravitational studies, although they weren't as precise back then by any stretch of the imagination. But spring balances are actually better at this than anything else. So he had access to some pretty good spring balances, but they're nothing like the tools that we use today. His model, or his drawing, I should say, is cited quite often in a lot of the Hollow Earth lore. Mm -hmm. And he did mention at least once in narratives that he thought there should be a void, but he'd never said how big. He, he's kind of in line with me on that part of it. I don't know, but there should be a void. I don't know how big. Hmm. So it, it seems pretty clear that scientists and mathematicians who are a lot smarter than I am have come to this conclusion by looking at gravity, by looking at the math, 
it seems to be for open-minded thinkers a, a reasonable conclusion that people have come to independently over time quite often. <laughs> well, fairly often. So far, we've only talked about three people, including me. <laughs> but, but you also have all this popular literature, Jules Byrne, uh, the Pellucidor series, even up to one of the sci-fi series had a hollow earth component mm -hmm. and some really good graphics to portray it, I might add. <laughs> but as far as serious scientific inquiry, Howley's the last one, I think. You have a lot of people who have speculated in between me and them. Wow. I don't know where to start, but some of them have founded complete religions around it. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. John Clive Sims would be one of those. Anyway, yeah. So where they get their information, I don't know. Maybe they're just channeling. Maybe they're just making it up. Maybe, <laughs> maybe they have a divine connection that I do not and probably never will understand. Mm -hmm. But a lot of people now and in the past have believed in a hollow earth theory of one form or another, going all the way back to our oldest known written record, the Epic of Gilgamesh, hmm. because he sent his best friend Inke into the underworld to talk to Gilgamesh's mother, because, well, she was immortal and he wanted a part of that. But once you went in, you couldn't come back, kind of like a black hole. Yeah, kind of like a black hole. So 5,000 years ago, a king was talking about going into the underworld. That doesn't necessarily mean going all the way to the center of the earth. But that brings us into the other realm of not only possibility, but pretty heavy belief. That there is an entire world within our world, not necessarily at the center, but subterranean realm of some kind. Mm -hmm. It's been written in a lot of popular stuff. Wow. Again, Jules Verne, Pellucidor, et cetera. But I don't find that one impossible. I don't even find it entirely unlikely because I've been in a lot of caves that went very deep. Some of them are not tourist caves either. <laughs> you got a cave in New Mexico that they know has well over 350 miles of passages. Jeez without a bit of sunlight <laughs> and it's not carved by water in that case it's carved by an acidic gas <laughs> coming from inside the earth yeah i mean i love the idea of it i like to entertain it but you know i've been in a couple of caves obviously far less than you but when you get in there it's like yeah there's a lot of space in here there might be miles of tube but unless there's some kind of food source light source some type of real abundance maybe on the other side of these tunnels i find it hard to believe that there could be much down there concur you also have tales of entering a cave and ending up in an artificial tunnel with everything from uh railroads to strange people mm -hmm. and i do not find it at all unlikely that the United States government or somebody has developed a technology to bore many, many very large tunnels. In fact, we know they have it. In 1962, the United States Air Force commissioned a tunnel digging machine that was atomically powered, had a nuclear reactor as its power source. Hmm. I mean, yeah, that's that stuff is seriously fascinating. Are there any, maybe maybe you can tell us a story of subterranean worlds that you might put stock in, that you might think ha has some validity? Well, that one's tough, but the two that are always discussed first in a forum or whatever are The Smoky God, which was published in, I believe it was 1894, about a man who, as a 12-year-old boy, went with his father on a fishing trip from Norway, ended up getting sucked into the hole at the top of the world, traversed the entire length of the inside by boat, incidentally, to Antarctica. And his father died during the voyage, and he was rescued in 1829, 1830, I guess it was. Mm -hmm. 
and it had a lot of interesting aspects that make sense, I guess, but of course, not even Antarctica was known much at that point. Coastline, about it. Right. And not even all the coastline had been mapped by then. Uh, the other one is Edidorfa, which is Aphrodite spelled backwards, incidentally. Huh. And it was the a first-person narrative of one who, someone who called himself I Am the Man. And he was taken forcibly into a cave, the description of which matches very closely with Mammoth Cave in Kentucky, and taken through unmarked secret passages down to the very center of the earth, including extremely near-zero gravitational at a certain radius of the earth, not at the center. And come to find out, yeah, the inside of the Earth should have its own little Lagrange points of near zero gravity. Just one, actually, between the center and the surface. Mm -hmm. But it's it's rather intriguing that someone had figured that out, you know, 125 years ago. Absolutely. And that second one you just mentioned, I'm not familiar with, but the, the smoky god Olaf Jansen story... I read that and I really wanted to believe. And obviously they wrote uh, in different language. They wrote uh, kind of fl more flowery, more poetic in that time. But it read to me like literature rather than a real diary, which was unfortunate. Yeah. But uh, there are some other ones that I think are interesting. I've heard you talk about uh, the subterranean world of the Makusis. Yes. Can you describe that for us? Sure. The a Makaxi, Makushi, depending on what your native language is. They live in an area that kind of borders between Ecuador and Brazil, and they have a mm, tribal memory of being gatekeepers to an opening that led to the center of the earth. They would go past that Lagrange point and describe it perfectly. Now, these are people who have never up until 20 years ago, maybe 30 years ago, never had a school, never had reading and writing and arithmetic. But they talked about how they would provision themselves getting ready for a trip into the earth. And when they got to the center, they would be reprovisioned for their exit. But it was the journey that was interesting because they would climb down like a ladder through this vertical tunnel and the further they went to a certain point the lighter they became less gravitational pull on them on this ladder and then they would turn around and start climbing down head first because the gravity was in the other direction and it took about two and a half weeks to do this climb each way Wow. So they had this. I should tell you how this ended, by the way. Sure. In 1912 or 13, somehow, someone talked them into showing them the entrance. And the inner earth people broke communications with Makuxi. Hmm. That's their tale. But that tale goes back to at least the late conquistador age. So 16, 30, 40. <laughs> Man, that's fascinating. That, that's the kind of story that I love to hear, especially if it can be somewhat corroborated with the math or the science. Yeah, I, I, have, to, I have to give kudos to a guy by the name of um, Dean. Dean Dominic De Lucia. Yes, thank you. Yeah, he's one of my favorite previous guests on this topic. Yeah, he's the one who, who translated it the Makuxi tale into English so that I could read it because my Spanish Portuguese is nearly non-existent. <laughs> but he, not only is he uh, very much into the hollow earth lore, he's professional level translator mm -hmm. for all three of those languages. Yeah. We are lucky to have him or these stories would be lost to the English speakers in a lot of cases. Yes. So, that story is so fascinating. Is that an outlier? Or are there any other corroborating stories that you know of that um, also speak of 
actual relationships with the inner earth beings to some degree? Well, many of the Native American, North American tribes have their origin stories that somehow incorporate in particular the Hopi, the Mandan, some of the uh, Shoshone talked about they came from inside the earth. And they have particularly, some of them, entertaining and picturesque descriptions of how this happened. Mm. Um, with the Hopi, they had the ant men helping them to get to the surface and survive on the surface, not just get here. With the Mandan, they had lived inside the earth for time eternal, and a grapevine sent a root down into a tunnel and someone climbed up it and dug around that root till they got out. Hmm. Climbed up that root until one particularly fortunate woman decided to climb up there and she broke off the root and no one else could come out. Wow. So, <laughs> yeah, it's colorful, descriptive, fun, but the basic premise is these tribes believe that they came from inside the earth. Maybe they were survivors of some catastrophe or something. Who knows? Mm -hmm. I mean, you have this guy by the name of Michio Kaiku. You know him? Yeah, yeah. String theory. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Probably one of the most respected cosmologists, uh, astrophysicist guys on the planet. And here about four or five years ago, he was appearing on, uh, I believe it was, that one was actually on Fox News. And he said, at some point, the human race is either going to have to figure out a way to get off this planet safely or get inside it. Because there's another ice age coming. And we can't survive on the surface during an ice age. So maybe he's got access to things I don't. But that's a particularly poignant statement coming from a guy like him. Absolutely. And I love that idea that there's might be cycles of, you know, extinction and repopulation. And that, like you said, the best protection from one of these inhospitable periods or eras would be going inside, especially if you don't have the technology to get off. So I like the idea that maybe there's huge disasters or inhospitable times in the surface. People, maybe people on the inside who know this is coming come up to the surface and say, hey, come on down. We'll take care of you during this time period and then shoot them back up. And then, you know, as time passes, all they have is that legend. And then that connection, to the inside is severed and we forget it's even there. Yes. We also <laughs> probably forget a lot of other connections because it's been, you know, 8,000, 9,000 years since the last cold snap. It's been 13,000 or so since the last true ice age. But either one of them was enough to interrupt any civilization that existed on the surface. Right. And we do that repeatedly. Uh, I should say the earth does that repeatedly. The solar system does it repeatedly. And I'd say that this whole global climate change warming thing. Yeah, we might be doing some stupid things, but we're not in control of the climate. No, no, I'm, I'm with you on that. So another slide in your presentation that I liked was you say that the hole at the North Pole is 1,100 by 2,300 miles. Where do those numbers come from? And can you tell us anything else about its potential location? Yes, it is in the Arctic. Uh, the Arctic Ocean is actually divided into two major basins with a line of mid-ocean ridge, if you will, kind of within it stretching basically from uh, about Franz Joseph Island over to Kamchatka. And the western side of that has a deeper basin. The western side of that is the dimensions you said. Mm -hmm. It's huge. It's an ocean. But at the bottom of that ocean, I can't tell you the exact coordinates off the top of my head, 80... 84.6 north, I believe it is, and 4.26 west. It sticks in my head for some reason. There is a 13,200 foot deeper basin within it. This is extremely deep. Mm -hmm. Leading to that hole in the bottom of the ocean are riverbeds at the bottom of the ocean. 
Okay. <laughs> so either there was no water in them at one time and water flowed there and yet didn't make a huge lake like it should draining off of a continent into a basin. Yeah. <laughs> or perhaps the colder fresh water melting off glaciers ran down through there and carved these underwater river beds, which is not, you know, impossible. Yeah. But yet it still didn't form a huge lake basin, which it would because of the difference in salinity temperature and a whole bunch of other factors that would enter into freshwater versus salt water at the bottom of an ocean. Mm -hmm. And that hole that is at the bottom of that basin at 13,200 feet is um, not plumbed well. Nobody knows just exactly how deep it is. They've only measured it to 13.2. Hmm. That's really odd, man. I've always kind of had a hard time rationalizing how the hole in a hollow earth paradigm could be in water. But I guess if we're talking about the gravitational switch in this basin is so, so, so deep, could it be deep enough to be past that, that gravity point where water is actually coming up rather than sinking down? Well, I'll put it this way. If I ever write a Hollow Earth novel, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Love it. Yeah, it because if it reached to, actually, you could probably do some rough calculations, figure out what that water column would have to be to be in stability, or what would cause it to become unstable for that matter, mm -hmm. which is another part of that novel, probably. Um, but yeah, the water column, we can get a rough idea of its diameter, and then we can make educated guesses at its length. It's a column of water. It's a cylinder. I don't know how deep that hole really is. Nobody really does. Yeah. We only know that it's deeper than the ocean bottom at, what, uh, two, and a, two and a quarter miles. Hmm. It's like almost like an inner earth fountain of water shooting out. Weird, man. So having worked in the military, I got to ask, because a lot of what's interesting about the hollow earth is these possible holes at the poles and the polar regions in general, having nations signed on to bar unsanctioned exploration there only fuels that kind of speculation. But clearly the military has a presence in both regions. They have to know something, right? I mean, did this ever come up in your time working with them? No, the only thing that actually came up pertinent to this whole question while I was working for the Navy was I got the opportunity to meet one of the junior officers who was aboard the USS Polaris when it surfaced through the ice at the North Pole hmm. and verified to my satisfaction that he was sincere when he said, yes, we, we did the shots. We were at 90 North, which became the title of a popular book about the voyage. 90 North. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, I'm old enough to remember the event being <laughs> in the news. Of course, I'm also older than space travel. <laughs> but the, the Polaris was, in a lot of the popular literature of the time, it was thought to be purpose-built to travel under the ice and surface there so that it could launch missiles at Russia or Soviet Union. It didn't have any missile, per se. It had torpedoes. It was an attack sub, not a boomer. Mm -hmm. So, yes, it was made so that it could go through the ice because that was a great way to resupply a submarine after months underwater. A plane could land on the ice. They could literally offload supplies right into the submarine. And then it would go back underwater and run another three months because it's a nuclear-powered submarine. <laughs> and all they really needed was food, fresh water, more fresh water than they could make on the submarine, and, uh, you know, letters from home, maybe. Yeah. Interesting. Did he, um, I mean, obviously he's inside a submarine, but did he describe anything uh, that we would consider odd about the polar region? Um. A little odd. He said that they had trouble with their compasses, which does not surprise me because interesting 
maybe coincidence, maybe whatever, but it was real heavy aurora borealis when they were there. It didn't show up much in the daytime, but the magnetic fields were still there. Mm -hmm. And of course, they were doing it in daytime because they had to do a sunshot with a, at that point in time, a real sextant. <laughs> they didn't have GPS or any of that crap. And there was no Loran at the North Pole. Hmm. So they were using archaic, not really archaic, but old, antique, certainly, instrumentation types. They could not go to 13,000 feet deep with that submarine. Too much pressure. Way too much pressure. In fact, most, most of the bathospheres that exist on this planet cannot go to that. Hmm. So do you put any stock in some of those early explorer reports of the uh, North Polar region where people say, oh, we ran into warm water, warm air. Uh, we saw birds migrating north and there seems to be green land up there. I think, you know, some people say that about the South Pole, too. But I think I hear it way more from those early North Pole explorers. But do you put any stock that they're in the idea that there could be some warm or tropical place up there? Because of the interaction between saltwater, saline, and freshwater, you can get a, honest to God, friction between those two types of water rubbing together. They don't mix as readily as most people would think. Tropical, not so much. Could you find palm fronds floating there? Certainly. The Gulf Stream goes from our Gulf Coast to basically South Arctic Ocean. So, yeah, I can I can understand maybe finding palm fronds, probably even some types of fauna that you wouldn't expect to find in the Arctic. But the the most interesting Arctic exploration to me was Edmondson's um, on the Fram. He, he designed and built this ship to go park in the ice at a certain place that he calculated and let it drift across the North Pole. And did that. And it took three and a half years to complete that voyage. Hmm. And there, that ship, pretty much all of the uh, specimens they collected, the leftover supplies, mostly medical, are all on display at the Fram Museum in Oslo, Norway. Wow. These guys were cold for three years. <laughs> no, I don't mean cold. They were cold yeah. they were they were not just sub freezing cold <laughs> and of course they couldn't acquire any more fuel in the arctic to run a stove or anything else <laughs> man i couldn't do it so you know of course of course no hollow earth conversation is complete without a mention of admiral bird and i'd i'd be happy to leave him out but you actually seem to have a different take and uh you might be of the opinion that at least one of his trips was funded by the Rockefellers. This is something Dennis Crenshaw mentioned to me on the phone, but is that your contention also? Yes, I think, uh, and Dennis did all that research, but I, I agree with all of his conclusions that the 1936-37 expedition was funded by the Rockefellers and all of the logs, all of the records, everything went to the Rockefellers, not to the U.S. Navy, because the Navy didn't have a stake in that expedition. The 1947 expedition was different. The Navy and the Marine Corps, of course, participated in that one, so they had a stake. Nobody really knows what happened there, because we have a little, little bit of narrative about, you know, something that lasted, well, half as long as it was supposed to. But um, the, 19, the, the 1930s expedition, they built specialized equipment, including a giant truck that would carry an airplane, uh, and people could live in it for months at a time, and it would traverse, in theory, all the snow and ice in Antarctica. It was written up in popular mechanics and popular science. There were films, you know, newsreels and whatnot. Mm-hmm. And during that time, during that expedition, Byrd established a secret society 
amongst the upper ranks of the people who were on that expedition. Hmm. Dennis found that interesting. By the way, Admiral Byrd only served one year in the Navy. Wow. And reached, reached a rank of Rear Admiral. Yeah. This is an uncle, or maybe great uncle, to the late Senator Robert Byrd. The Byrd family of Virginia has been in Virginia since, well, there's been a Virginia. <laughs> So I guess, does this Rockefeller involvement and some of these bloodline connections affect his credibility, in your opinion, I assume? No, actually, he was a very learned man. He he was groomed to do that from an early age. But he also threw enough resources that were not necessarily government-supplied resources at this exploration, not just this one, but both polars explorations that it's pretty clear to me that he was on that tack and that he was appointed to make these discoveries if there were any mm -hmm. but not for the benefit of mankind <laughs> right right for a cabal of elites that have funded the project yes interesting so god i would love to get my hands on uh you know the real data from that because it seems to be another case where the elite have put their money and attention and energy into something that they would, uh, you know, poo poo on the surface and tell us there's nothing to it. But yet they've put money and resources into it and probably learned something in that area. And they're just going to keep it close to the chest for as long as they can. Well, you also have to consider that there was a concurrent effort by Nazi Germany to do basically a land claim in Antarctica. New Schwabenland, and they flew over it with bombers and dropped flags with a marker plate with an individual number on each plate and the Nazi flag, including swastika. And they they covered, I forget what it was, 490,000 square miles or something. Damn. <laughs> and uh, strangely, even more strange when you get it into international law, politics, maritime law, the claim is still valid even though the government has changed. <laughs> That's interesting. Another thing on the on the subject of land claims is I pulled an article off of the Hollow Earth Insider website that talks about Russia making a subtle play for control of the Arctic in more recent times. How might that play into things in this uh, potentially Hollow Earth paradigm? Are they maybe trying to uh, either get, of course, just the information or potentially harness the energy that they think might be inside. Well, it's not just that energy. They've also discovered still frozen methane fields left over from the previous ice age. So they're hedging their bets, I believe. Whether they have, quote unquote, inside information, I don't know. They certainly have a history of exploring and exploiting the esoteric knowledge. Look, then so do we. I mean, <laughs> men who stare at goats, as an example. Absolutely. But with the, the methane field, it's a very ready source of energy that actually um, it's better to burn it than to let it escape into the atmosphere. And if there is this other gravitational energy and that's the place to get a hold of it then they're going to be well set but basically what they're doing is establish uh, re-establishing uh, revitalizing and refurbishing and resupplying a whole bunch of world war ii era bases that they had going to prevent a nazi invasion of siberia and northern russia so i can't blame them either way <laughs> yeah man uh the esoteric subtext of government or elite actions is a real interesting angle to me, but that was definitely big with the Nazis and their whole exploration of everything from Tibet to the South Pole. Yes. Well, and, and the North Pole. They they did their own expeditions to the North Pole mm -hmm. and to the lands around the Arctic Ocean and a few lands within the Arctic Ocean because once they walked into Norway because they didn't really have to conquer it. Uh, they were invited in by a trader. Then 
Svarbald, or what we would call uh, Spitsbergen in those days, a set of islands at 700 miles north of Norway, they uh, took possession of it with, you know, a squad, and uh, they were trying to mine coal and look for other minerals to make them available to their war effort. It wasn't a paying proposition for them, but they had a history of exploring the Arctic at the time. Mm. That was actually during the war. Interesting, man. So yeah. <laughs> this has been pretty amazing, man. Really blew my simple stoner mind. <laughs> and uh, I know we left a lot of stuff on the table, but hopefully we can do it again sometime. Yep. You definitely know your stuff. Would you like to remind people about your book and anywhere else they can follow up on you and what you got going on before we really call it in? Sure. The book is The Graves of the Golden Bear, Ancient Fortresses and Monuments of the Ohio Valley. It is available on Amazon, Kindle and print. It's available at Books a Million by order. It's on Barnes and Noble uh, and their whatever their electronic version is. Uh, it's also available from Ancient American Magazine and from the publisher, Grave Distractions Publications, GraveDistractions.com. Mm -hmm. uh, and I'm writing for Ancient American well, about every issue. I'm working on number 12 in a series right now due at the end of this month. Um, in the middle of August, uh, 10th, 11th, 12th, I think the dates are, I'll be 